Welcome, everyone, to Creating a Family. Talk about foster, adoptive, and kinship care. I'm Dawn Davenport. I'm the host of this show, as well as the director of the nonprofit, creatingafamily.org. Today, we'll be talking about a new report that was just published by the National Council for Adoption on birth parent experiences and adoption. We will be talking with the two lead authors of this report. First, Ryan Hanlon. He is the executive director of the National Council for Adoption. They are the national adoption organization providing resources and education for all people and organizations in the adoption world, as well as advocating for sound adoption practices. We will also be speaking with Laura Bruder. She is the executive director of Brave Love, an organization dedicated to changing the perception of adoption by acknowledging birth moms for their brave decision. Welcome, Ryan and Laura, to Creating a Family. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks having, for having us. us, Dan. Okay, guys, I love this report. I absolutely love the research. It was so well designed. It was it was fascinating reading. For I cannot recommend enough to anyone who is listening. If you are touched by adoption in any way, whether you be an adoptive parent, a birth parent, or an adoptee, or an adoption professional, this is, should be must reading. It is. It was fascinating. I was so glad you had done it, and I was also like, gosh, why haven't we done this type of stuff before? And then I thought, no, no, let me just be thankful that uh, we're having it now. <laughs> you know, Don, Laura and I were saying the same thing, you know, this, and, and we, the same as you, we're just, we're so grateful to have this information, but we're especially grateful to the many birth parents who responded, who you know, they, yes. they shared with us. And that was uh, generous of them to share about their experiences, good and bad. And so we're grateful to learn from them. And exactly. we hope that the lessons that are, are captured here, the experiences, the information can be used to improve practices in the future. And you had so many. I it was the real strength of this report is the number of people who responded and shared their honest opinions. And of those you were able to include in the report, if I read this correctly, you had 1,160 birth mothers and 239 birth fathers. You had more who responded, but you weren't able to use all of their data. It might have been incomplete for whatever reason, which was just good from a research perspective. And Ryan, that's something that you bring to NCFA is the strong research background, which speaks to my heart. So I, I, I know it does, Don. And, and, you know, some of what we also did, Laura and I partnered with external researchers on this report. So we brought them in. They have expertise that we don't have. And they were able to, the three focus groups that we did with birth mothers, they co-facilitated those. We weren't a part of that. And they got the transcripts, coded the data, and then we were able to include that information here. They were able to do the really heavy lifting in terms of the mathematical statistical analysis, yes. include that here. And Laura and I were both really committed to ensuring that we went through the oversight with an IRB, an institutional review board, so that the university that we partnered with would have had oversight of this research project. That's a, an ethical choice that we made to ensure that we were following good processes. And we want others to have confidence that when we're interacting with birth parents, we're doing so appropriately, and that the steps we took in terms of our research was done in accordance with the standards that are, are set forth by these you know, universities for the researchers. The same standards were applied here. Excellent. Laura, how did you, and I say you, I, this is the plural you, how did you find the birth parents and get them to fill out the survey? Yeah, great question. Well, over the last 11 years that Brave Love has been around, we have over time kind of created a community of birth parents, in particular birth moms that have gotten involved with Brave Love in one way or the other, whether sharing their story or attending an event or whatnot. And so we blasted the flyer out for both the focus groups as well as the survey. And then NCFA did that as well. And I think that was what was so exciting from the get-go, Ryan. You can agree or disagree, but from the get-go, there was an overwhelming response. And you mentioned that, and just like the strength of this study is the number of exactly. birth parents who participated, but we saw that almost immediately just with the inquiries from 
the focus group. That's right, Laura. Yeah, we, we had hundreds of birth moms responding saying, yes, we're open to doing a focus group. And our research team was, you know, they were a little overwhelmed. They actually had to randomly sample amongst those many hundred that expressed interest just to bring people in. And then, you know, from there, huge response when the survey went forth. As Laura said, we we reached out to their partners. We reached out to the adoption agencies and attorneys that work with NCFA. We asked them to share it with the um, clients they've worked with in the past. And we're really grateful for the, the large sample size that we have and for yes. the thoughtfulness in the responses that, yes. that parents provided to us. It's shown through. I, it, it, creating a family, we do. In fact, we're in the midst of a randomized control trial right now. We're getting ready to start another randomized control trial. We're actually in the midst of two that are currently happening, and we're getting ready to start, and all of these are randomized, and we have them some quasi-experimental. So to put it mildly, I mean, of course, what you always are praying for is please let there be a high sample size because <laughs> we're, we're going to put all this effort and money into it, and we won't be able to show anything unless we have enough people. So when I saw the amount of people, you amount of birth parents, I was like, man, I am impressed because <laughs> that's what you want. Now, Laura, were most of these birth parents through domestic infant adoption rather than adoptions from foster care? And did you make a distinction? Was that an important distinction for you? It was an important distinction. So they were all domestic infant adoptions rather than adoptions from foster care. And that was intentional from the get-go because we know that there are unique experiences for birth parents when it comes to domestic infant adoption and unique experiences for birth parents, biological parents, when it comes to foster care to adoption. So that was intentional. Yeah, I wondered that when I was reading the intro, because we work in both fields, in both areas, and I suspected that you're, I see why you did it, because birth parents, children are in foster care. There is less or there is no choice. One of the more interesting findings that I wanted to start with, and then we're going to just kind of work through a lot of the different findings, but one I wanted to start with was that birth mothers who placed their children for adoption, either after, including 2010 and later, were much more likely to report being satisfied with their decision than in birth mothers who placed their child between like 1970, say, and 2010, or even before 1970, and that birth mother's level of satisfaction with their adoption decision, it it looked like by the chart that it increased every decade since 1970. I thought that was fascinating. I I can hypothesize some reasons, but I I think that may be a little dangerous since I'm not the expert here. (laughs) Yeah, Don, you're exactly right. That is what our research found. We broke it up by time period. And so for birth parents who responded that they had done their, their adoption placement in the 1970s or earlier, that was the first time period. Then we looked at the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, and then from 2010 and onward. So we had a total of five different time periods that we looked at for birth moms. Because of a smaller sample size for birth fathers, we only broke it up into two periods. But you're exactly right. Each um, time period got a higher and higher satisfaction level. You know, unfortunately, when we look at this, the birth mothers who placed in the 1970s or earlier, the majority were not satisfied with their adoption decision. The the majority would say that they weren't satisfied, strongly dissatisfied or not satisfied or had a more neutral stance. But then later, every preceding decade, it got better and better. And there is a statistically significant difference in the 2000s and onward when we're comparing it to the 1970s. And so really for the last 30 plus years, the majority of birth mothers are satisfied with their adoption decision, which doesn't mean that the job's done here. There's still a number of birth mothers who would say they're not satisfied with their decision. And and of course, that's not what any of us would want. And and then to your point, and, and Laura and I can talk to you more about this, there are reasons, you know, we were interested in this as well. So we looked at what some of those variables are. Yes. We looked at the bivariate correlations, you know, just, you know, one other factor, how does that relate to satisfaction? And then we looked at multivariate factors and and how they would impact satisfaction level as well. Yeah. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. Originally, I thought, well, does that mean that birth mothers, as they age, become increasingly dissatisfied with their decision? But that's not what your research indicated, because you're able to, to compare some variables. So, 
What are, Laura, some of the variables as to what you found that correlated with birth mothers that were strongly satisfied or satisfied with their decision? Right, right. Well, when it comes to satisfaction and after we did all of of those comparisons, the factors that contributed the most to greater satisfaction for birth parents were receiving accurate information and making a decision that was free of coercion. And those were the strongest indicators. And Ryan, you can probably chime in on that more. Well, first of all, what, I, and Ryan, maybe you can answer this. I think it was accurate discussion. information. Yeah. Are you wondering what yes. accurate information? What's accurate information? <laughs> now with adoptive parents, accurate information is all the information that's available, you know, on the child. So I was thinking, and what would be inaccurate information that would not be unethical? So anyway, Ryan, how did you define accurate information? We didn't. So for both of those variables, making a free non-coerced decision and the receipt of accurate information. We ask that in terms of the birth parents' perception or their experiences. They're reflecting back on that. Do they believe they received accurate information about adoption? And and that could be, you know, what's involved with adoption? What what are their rights? Do they have a, a right to make an adoption plan to choose the adoptive parents? Do they have a right to determine the level of openness that they want after adoption? Were they given accurate information about who the parents are? what the situation would be for their child. And, you know, that that's another thing that we can look at over time to see what differences might be present. Certainly, we know anecdotally from hearing from many professionals that the practices in this regard have changed over time. But the same is true for making a free, non-coerced decision. This is the birth parent's perception of that. So how much do they think they were pressured or coerced to choose adoption as opposed to being able to make that of their own free you know, accord after the situation they found themselves in? And, and as Laura said, this was different for birth mothers and birth fathers, but for birth mothers, those two factors, the receipt of accurate information, making a free non-coerced decision were very significant in impacting adoption satisfaction. So we, we did what's called a regression analysis which is the more sophisticated mathematical method of really looking at multiple variables in relation to that dependent variable, the adoption satisfaction. And we we looked at the impact. The model we created actually had a third variable, and that was w- whether or not the parent had connection with the child. They, they were maintaining contact with their child right. yep. after adoption, because that in, in the bivariate correlations also looked like a very strong factor that actually fell out of the model is not significant when we were accounting for the other two. Which totally surprised me. Right. I did not expect that. It, it did for us as well. I thought that was going to be extremely important. I, I figured the other two uh, were, but but that's what fell out in the, the model for birth mothers. And it was really that making a free non-coerced decision that came across with the, the largest magnitude or the most powerful in terms of its impact on adoption satisfaction. And so with um, something like regression, we wouldn't say it's causal. We wouldn't say that's what caused that adoption satisfaction, but we would say it can be used as a predictor. So if a birth mother today were to be able to say she made a free non-coerced decision, that would be a strong predictor that she's going to be satisfied with her decision for adoption in the future. Which is something that all of us involved in the the world of, of adoption need to be striving for. Right. That should be our goal. Hi, guys. This is Dawn. As you can tell, I am loving this conversation. This is right up my alley. I hope you're enjoying it, too. And if you are, I think you would enjoy some of the free courses that we have in our online education center. Our partners, the Jockey Bean Family Foundation, sponsor these courses, so we're able to offer them to you for no charge. You can check them out at bit.ly slash JBF support. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash JBF support. Another finding that doesn't surprise me, but is, is certainly sad is the vast majority of birth mothers reported experiencing stigma associated yeah. with their status as a birth parent or having made the decision to place a child. In fact, the percentage of birth mothers who experience some level of stigma about their decision has risen 20% yeah. since 1970. So it's inversely related to the satisfaction number. The stigma is going up. Did you say- 
say that surprised you or didn't surprise you? I, I Well, no, I don't know that it surprised. I was made me sad. It did not surprise me that there was stigma. I guess it didn't surprise me now that I'm thinking mm-hmm. about it as to back in the day, it was right. the only honorable thing to do if you found yourself pregnant without a husband. And now you have so many more options that I right. suppose that we would expect stigma to increase. So now that you're saying it that way. But it is interesting that even though stigma is increasing, so is satisfaction with the decision. That right. surprised me. I mean, in that sense, yeah. So, Laura, out of curiosity, did it surprise you that stigma had increased? I literally had the same response as you, where I was like, yes, but no. But I, like, <laughs> Great minds think alike, Laura. <laughs> right, exactly. It did make me sad, you know. Yeah, same. But then once I began to think about it a little bit more, I think it also, Ryan can attest to this because we've said it multiple times, We just wish we had asked more questions about stigma. And so, you know, research leads to research. So I'm just going to say next time. (laughs) Yeah, Don, one of the things that Laura and I did was we got this data and we were surprised. So we started looking at stigma by, you know, other categories. Can this be explained by race? Are there significant differences? Are there differences by time period? And as you mentioned, that's where we see the frequency of birth mothers who say, that there was no source of stigma, you know, had changed. And, you know, for your listeners, we asked the source of the stigma. So we, and then we listed a number of different categories. Was it the parents, other relatives, friends, other birth parents, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And and we asked a number of different categories and saying, were these sources of stigma? And they could choose more than one. So, and many did actually, the majority chose more than one source of stigma. And it's the number who said there were, no sources of stigma. That's what changed over time. And that for me was a surprise. As we've talked about it, we have some theories as to why that might be. And and Laura, why don't you tell her about, you know, you took this data back to a team of birth mothers that you work with and you asked them about this. Yeah. You know, we have an advisory council of birth moms at Brave Love and we shared some of the preliminary findings. And they weren't shocked by the stigma piece. One particular birth mom said, and this isn't an exact quote, but as birth parents have gained the education, the society hasn't. Mm. And so society is behind and therefore the shame and the stigmas and the stereotypes that still surround that decision, Mm -hmm. it still exists. And that was even reflected by some of the comments that were made by the participants from our focus group. You know, one birth mom said, I just feel like I don't have anyone in my corner. Mm -hmm. I read that. Yeah, it doesn't, that that one just made you want to reach out and say, no, you have, somebody can be in your corner if we just have to look. Right, right. Or even, Mm -hmm. even women that shared, you know, they were confident in the decision that they'd made, but it wasn't something they could talk about yeah. you know, with those around them, with a friend, a close friend. And so one of those themes from the focus group was just like how important it was to have someone they could trust and rely on. Mm-hmm. Somebody with a lived experience. That was that you also, they, they talked about that in the focus groups too, about the support groups, right. just being around others who have lived your experience. We know that's important regardless of what your life experience is for adoptive parents, for adoptees. Right. So of course it makes sense that peer group support would be. Ryan, I am curious, did you find, and I, it, this is in the report and I don't, I don't have the report open. Did you find that there was a difference in stigma, depending on the race of the birth parent? You know, it wasn't an overwhelming finding in this regard. We looked at, again, by those different categories, and there were some differences, but nothing that was very revealing. The few categories that did break out and show differences by race were stigma from other relatives, stigma from healthcare workers, and stigma from religious clergy or religious leaders. So those appear to be different for at least one of the different groups when we separate by race. So at least one of those would would look very different than the others when we did that analysis. But it didn't help explain what we were looking at in terms of stigma. In fact, in some ways, it, it raised a lot more questions. It appears that for women who identified as white, that they 
were both more likely to not experience stigma. So they were the largest category who experienced no stigma. But then they often, for those who didn't select that, looked like they were selecting you know, multiple sources of stigma elsewhere. So they were, were often the highest in other categories for the other in individuals who responded to that question. So as Laura said, for us, it raises a lot more questions mm -hmm. than I think we have answers for regarding stigma. But even the, the focus groups really spoke to this really meaningfully about the belief that others are really judgmental of their decision yes. and really misunderstanding what's motivating their decision. And, yeah. and that came through really clear in the focus groups where they they were saying, you know, we know that we the reasons we were doing this, but we think other people are judging us and they're making assumptions mm -hmm. that, that are wrong, but they don't have a good means to communicate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and something that jumped out to me, and I'm sure to both of you as well, is that the stigma increased from the 1970s to now for healthcare workers. And boy, if that's not an area for advocacy, I don't know what is. That did surprise me. I don't know why that is either. Laura, do right. you have ideas why that might be? Honestly, I don't know, but I Fair answer. I can theorize. <laughs> You know, that kind of like what you were referencing earlier, now that the other options, you know, single parenting is less stigmatized today than it Very was so. 50 years ago, you know, and even just the social acceptability of abortion. Mm -hmm. But I, as you said, I think, I think it obviously highlights a huge need for continued education to the healthcare and medical community. Yeah, I would certainly think so. I, I do think that was something that, that left me. But I totally understand what you're saying is that after you've done surveys, I've been in this situation. In fact, we're kind of in it now. We look back and we go, gosh, why didn't we ask this, this, and this? Right. And part of the reason is that you know people won't take really long surveys, so you're trying to keep exactly. your numbers down. Exactly. Yeah, oh. So then you go, darn, if I had only asked. All right. Anyway. Let me pause this fascinating discussion right now to tell you about Creating a Family's interactive training support group curriculum for foster, adoptive, and kinship families. This training or curriculum is, in my opinion, something I am just so proud of. I think it is excellent. It is expert-based and trauma-informed, as with most of the resources for Creating a Family. It is also video-based and interactive. It can be done in person or online, and there's a library of 25 curricula for you to choose from on topics that are directly relevant to foster, adoptive, and kinship families. So if you're involved in training kinship families or foster or adoptive families, or if you are running support groups, please check it out at parentsupportgroups.org. That is parentsupportgroups.org. All right. So let's talk about some of the demographics, just going back to the beginning. I, the two things I desperately wanted to talk about, I had to jump out immediately <laughs> well, and talk about. Well, of course. About. It's really fun. Yeah, this fun. I will fun. say it's really fun to talk to someone that's like got fresh eyes on this. Like Ryan and I have been talking about this for a while. And so it's fun to, to talk to an outsider as it's energized by the information and just the opportunity to improve. So yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine who is a researcher at a university, she said, when you get the results in, it's like it's like opening Christmas presents. She said that that's the reason that keeps me going. She said, I think it's tenure and then the and the you know the publisher perish. She goes, but it's really not. It's how exciting it is when you start seeing the data and you start analyzing it and you go, Well, I'll be. And so anyway, I always remember well, I'll tell that. you this. I'll tell you this, between Ryan and I, he is much more of the research nerd than I am, but he has taught me so much. <laughs> so now it's like rubbing off on me where I'm like, okay, analyzing this data. This is interesting. This so. is more than just numbers. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. Okay. So what are the demographics of the birth moms and dads who completed the survey? Just generally the age, race, education level now, and number of adoption placements. And I don't know who to ask that question to. Uh, Ryan, should we start with you? Why don't we first say how old they were at the time of survey response? 
and how long it had been since their adoption. So yes. for mothers, they were about 40 years old at the time of taking this survey, and it had been approximately 15 years, you know, on, on average gotcha. since their placement. Right. Um, for birth fathers, they were an average of 31 years, so significantly younger, and it had only been you know, seven and a half years since their placement. And so that's, you know, just describing the age at the time of mm -hmm. taking the survey. But we asked them how old they were when they did the adoptive placement. They're both a, around 26 years old. A birth mom's mean age was a, a little bit older than that. And the median age was a little bit younger, but they're around 26 years old. And uh, we asked a ton of demographic questions. So if your listeners are interested in disability status, military service, LGBTQ identification, mm -hmm religion. We asked a ton of questions. You asked about education, Don. Mm -hmm. The demography here is pretty varied. And so there's not a, a simple way to, to describe either birth mothers or birth fathers. The majority have some college or, or greater in terms of their highest level of education. 24%, so you know, about a quarter of birth moms have a bachelor's degree, an additional 20% of the highest level was a, a graduate degree. So we're looking at close to half of birth mothers having a college education or more. Um, it's not as high for birth fathers. And, you know, when you compare this to, say, Census Bureau data, this is, you know, individuals who are trending, you know, often better than the, the U.S. population, not by leaps and bounds, but this is not an uneducated, you know, section of our country. This is, you know, a pretty widespread in terms of their educational experiences or achievements. And the same or higher usually than U.S. Census Bureau data would show. Your other question there is something we were really interested in. I have it here. And Laura might want to speak to this more, too, in terms of what she's heard from the individuals that she works with. But the number of adoptive placements they've made, 9 out of 10, you know, 89% have done just one adoptive placement now for birth mothers. Another 8% have done two. And 3% have done three or more placements. So it's not an insignificant number that has, you know, mm -hmm. over 10% have done more than one placement, you know, as a birth mother. For birth fathers, it actually was a little bit higher than that in terms of the numbers that have done more than one placement. Again, it's a smaller sample size that we have, but it was 81% that said that they've only been involved with one adopted placement. And the majority of your respondents were white. That's right. And is that reflective that the majority of women making adoption placements are white? Or is that reflective of how you were able to distribute the survey? So we would be careful to, to you know, talk about like our, our sampling methods and then the limitations in our ability to generalize to a wider population. We talked earlier about the fact that this does have a large sample size, but we want to be mindful that this didn't come from like census level data where we drill right. down and randomly selected. But this is also consistent with what we see in the field where the majority of placements are expectant mothers who are you know, considering adoption and making placements are white. And so our data doesn't really skew from that too much. For birth fathers, I think we, we showed a lot wider range in terms of mm -hmm. race and ethnicity. And it's it's hard to know because there's been so few studies done mm -hmm. of birth fathers. You know, our sample size is, is obviously much smaller for birth fathers compared to birth mothers, but it's one of the larger sample sizes, yeah. if not the largest out there exactly. of the research body. And so the conclusion that I would come to is we just need to keep doing you know more and better research to continue to understand this. But I, I don't think, you know, to your question, I think it's normal for an adoption and see very similar results for their clientele. And then, of course, different parts of the country are going to have different populations that they're more likely to serve. And so depending on a particular adoption agency or adoption attorney, they're going to have a population that's you know, representative of the area they live. Well, and you're talking about private infant adoptions. You're not picking up women whose aunt is raising their child or their sister or their mother. Right. So that may skew with culture and ethnicity as well. So, you know, I think you're right. If they did a kinship adoption, though, they would have been eligible to complete our survey, but done as a private relinquishment. So we were looking right. for voluntary relinquishments as the eligibility here. Right. In that situation where the child was involved, you know, with the child welfare system and had parental rights terminated 
And then, well, even yeah. without that, or they the grandmother doesn't adopt the child; she just raises yeah, the she, child. She's just providing some type of right, yeah. and I think that varies by race as well. And, and so, in that situation, if it hadn't been legally finalized, right. that family would not have been considered eligible for this survey. Yes. Let me stop right here and ask. I know you are listening to this podcast, but are you a follower or subscriber to this podcast? If not, please, whatever platform you're listening to this, please go there, click in Creating a Family, and click on that subscribe or follow button. When you do, we have over 15 years, almost 16 years, of archive shows Once you subscribe, you can just scroll to your heart's content and the titles will reflect what the content is. And most of them are evergreen and I think you will truly enjoy them. So please subscribe now. All right. So one of the things I wanted to ask about is birth parent involvement in the adoption process. Laura, how do you see that has changed Let's not go back all the way to the 1970s, but, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, have you seen that there has been a shift towards what birth parents are encouraged to be involved in? Sure. You know, based on our research and what we've just talked about, we know that birth parents are more satisfied with their adoptions if they were provided accurate information and they made their own decision. They were not coerced into choosing adoption. And so I think what's changed is the empowerment piece in that women, expectant mothers, they're in the driver's seat in regards to what they want during that decision-making process. So from choosing a family to saying kind of, what kind of openness they want, and then said agency, you know, shows them profile books of families that are also wanting that level of openness, you know, or Mm -hmm. even allowing her to kind of create that personalized adoption plan in which she can even say what she wants her hospital experience to look like, you know, That's what I've witnessed in terms of birth parent involvement and kind of what's changed is expectant parents are more in the driver's seat. They get more choice and have more say. And I think, too, we've kind of alluded to this and the role that birth fathers play, too, is significant and important. And we know that. I mean, I think it's beautiful how we saw participants in the survey range in age from 18 to 83 years old for birth mothers. Wow, that that is an age range. That's a gap. (laughs) Yeah, you know, the time that they took the survey. Mm -hmm. And then for birth fathers, I think up to like 77 years old. And I think it reminds us that their voice matters and they have something to say and making sure that we give space Mm -hmm. to listen. So um, can I answer your question? Sure. No, you absolutely did. Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, you know, in terms of some of the questions we asked, Don, for your listeners, we asked them about, you know, who are the individuals who are providing support for your decision? What's important for you in choosing parents? What are the concerns that you had prior to your placement? We were really trying to better understand that decision-making process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We asked them to reflect on their decision and placing for adoption. Similar to that adoption satisfaction, we just asked them to reflect on, on that question and ask if they believe they made a good decision. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to look at, at that decision-making from a number of different lenses. And we really wanted to have you know a better understanding of what that experience was like in making that decision. And we wanted adoption professionals, prospective adoptive parents, to, to really be able to better understand what that experience is like for birth mothers in particular yeah. who are expressing a lot of concerns that they have prior to replacement. And yet they're moving forward with these decisions anyway. So let's talk about satisfaction with their decision because that is a very interesting topic. And I think your results are interesting. So Ryan, I'll direct this one to you. One of the questions you asked was of them to reflect on their adoption decision and the satisfaction. Can you talk some about what you found with that, with that question? 
Yeah, absolutely, Don, you're right. So earlier we talked about adoption satisfaction, very similar to that, but we wanted to make sure this was a separate question. We asked birth parents to reflect on their adoption decision and ask them to rate you know, how well they agree with the statement that adoption was the right decision for them. So they yeah. can strongly disagree, agree, they can be neutral, they could strongly agree or agree. So they, they had you know, five choices on a Likert scale in terms of what they could choose there. And the majority of birth mothers and birth fathers said that they agreed or strongly disagreed it was the right decision for them. Now, along with you know that question and the question about satisfaction, very differently, we asked something more abstract. We asked, do you believe adoption can work in the best interest of adoptive parents? Do you believe adoption can work in the best interest of birth parents? Do you believe adoption can work in the best interest of children? Three separate questions we asked there as well. Again, the majority of birth parents would say yes to all three of those questions. It's not the same for all three groups. And, you know, unfortunately, from birth parents' perspectives, they are going to come out the lowest there. But it's still the majority of birth parents who would say this can work in Mm -hmm. everyone's best interest. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. Laura, I think this will be of great interest to our audience. What factors were important to expectant moms and dads when making the choice of adoptive parents? We get this question, what are they looking for? We worry a little that that means that the parents want to try to mold themselves into whatever that thing is, and we strongly encourage against that. That goes back to the whole accurate information at the the beginning. But what were of the expectant moms and dads, well, at this point, birth parents, because they've already made the decision, what were they looking for when they chose a family? Yeah, you know, multiple factors, of course, but over half indicated adoptive parent views on openness and adoption. And Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was number one for both birth mothers and fathers. And then number two for birth mothers, political, social, and religious views, followed by number of children in the home. But did number of children mean that they wanted to see a child in the home or they wanted it to be a childless home at the time? Or do you know? We didn't ask that. Yeah. So we listed a whole bunch of factors and we said, you know, indicate which ones are important in choosing parents. And we, you know, gave them an option to to fill in the blank for other two. Gotcha. That that was something they selected. You know, for me, Don, this came a a little bit as a surprise. Right. It was much more important the number of children in the home compared to something like the parent's age or the parent's race. Yeah. So we that surprised me as well. But yeah. Far fewer birth mothers indicated that that was an important factor for them. What surprised me the most, though, was what Laura indicated. The second most important factor they indicated was the adoptive parent's political, social, and religious views. Mm-hmm. We didn't dive into asking more information with the survey, but but that was to them something that that's very important Almost half of birth mothers said that's an important factor in choosing the parents. Yeah, and I wanted to know, okay, is it more their political beliefs or they're more their religion? Or I wanted to, yeah. Right. Right. I'm not being critical. Believe me, I'm not. (laughs) No, we're with you, Don. You know, you get it back, the results, like we were saying, and then you're like, we should have asked all three of us separate, and we should have, Mm -hmm. you know. We can have a hundred more questions. <laughs> oh, trust me. I We are in that exact position. We're looking at our results from one of the randomized control trials we were running. And we're going, why didn't we ask it? Or for uh, us, it's why didn't we ask it a different way? Because we right. can see some of the fallacies. And now in the way that the question was asking, we're like, oh, darn. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Ask a few more. And then, yeah, anyway, one of the uh, your findings that struck me as poignant was the main concerns that, and this was birth moms, had after placement. And the primary concerns that they expressed were that they would miss their child. That one, of course, that would make sense. And then followed by concern of not knowing what would happen in their child's life, which tugs at you. And then the last of the ones that you, primary ones you found were that my child will be angry with me in the future. So, I mean, that's Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. But, you know, one of the things I loved about this is I I think that 
and I speak from those of us in the adoption world, I think that we need to not humanize so much, but just b- help people recognize the diversity and who who birth parents are. Yeah. And I guess in some ways, when I read that, you go, well, of course, that's what you'd be worried about. And yeah. And mm-hmm. of course, then that's why over half indicated like an important factor in choosing adoptive parents is okay, what are their views on openness? You know, because their concern is missing their child and not knowing what will happen to their child, you know? Yeah, and that is one of the areas that creating a family is adoption support and training and education organization. And one of the areas that we recognize we need to do a better job, although we certainly attempt to do the best job we can in this, but there's area for growth. And that is, instilling in adoptive parents, because after the adoption, the adoptive parents have the power and birth parents realize that. And Mm -hmm. there is nothing that breaks my heart more than when, and I understand there are good reasons that somebody may choose to not honor the agreement they made. However, it needs to be exceptional when you do that. And instilling that and helping adoptive parents recognize that They've got to be there for the long. You just don't cut and run because they annoy you or because they aren't like you or because for any of the myriad of reasons that that we hear people say, anyway, that's a soapbox and I'll get off of it. (laughs) Well, Don, Don, just on that section, we listed the number of different potential concerns that, you know, birth mother might have as Uh she's thinking through her placement. And, but then they were able to rate the magnitude of those concerns, you know, from no concern, minor concern, moderate concern to a major concern. And what struck us was Laura and I were, you know, analyzing this. You compare birth mothers to birth fathers. Birth mothers are much more likely to describe many of these as major concerns. Right. Whereas for birth fathers, it's often much more moderate in terms of their concern level. And then when you look at the highest frequency for major concern. It's all the ones that are related to the child. These birth parents are concerned about their children. You know, their relationship with their child is a big part of that. They're concerned about that. That is something that they're thinking about as they're making this process. Yes. For example, they're far less concerned about disappointing their friends or family. Not that it's inconsequential to them. It clearly is. According to the data, all of these are important to them, but they're not as worried about disappointing the child's other birth parent. They're really concerned about the relationship with their child and the impact on their child. And that's why the stigma piece stings so much. Yeah. Because people misunderstand birth parents and think that they're neglecting their child or abandoning their child or not being responsible enough. And Mm -hmm. as we all know, it's not the case. Yeah, no. And I thought this was a just, an, it, this is neither here nor there in many ways as to what we're talking about. But I did think it was interesting that of the people who responded to your survey, of the birth parents who responded to your survey, 78% of the birth moms have some form of contact with their child and almost 74% of the birth fathers. So we also don't know what the age of the children are. I mean, sure. some of these could be adults. And so that would not surprise me, but nor would the 78 nowadays wouldn't surprise me at all for even, but that tells you that it was of top mind when they were making the decision and their biggest concern afterwards. This show, as well as all the resources at Creating a Family, couldn't happen without the support of our partners. And one such partner is Hopscotch Adoptions. They have been a partner of Creating a Family for a long time, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate their support. Hopscotch Adoptions is a Hague-accredited international adoption agency placing children from Armenia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Georgia, Ghana, Guyana, Morocco, Pakistan, Serbia, and Ukraine. They specialize in the placement of kiddos with Down syndrome and other special needs, and they also do a lot of kinship adoptions. They place kids throughout the U.S. and offer home study services and post-adoption services to residents of North Carolina and New York. Well, guys, this was just a terrific research report. Is there anything else? I'll start with you, Laura, and then I'll go to Ryan. Anything else, Laura, that you findings you want people to know that we haven't talked about? Because it's a it's not super long read, but it is a very in depth read. So 
we can't cover it all. But is there anything that you particularly want to highlight? Oh, well, there's so much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, it's like, what, what stands out the most? I think this research obviously helps put data behind the anecdotes and behind the stories that I've heard and, and Ryan has well, and I know you too, Dawn. But I think we kind of mentioned it earlier, but again, I think it bears repeating just the space is needed for birth parents' experiences to be shared mm-hmm. and giving them opportunity to share their story. And that can look mm-hmm. like lots of different things. But I think from the get-go, we were just encouraged by the response and the involvement and honored that someone would take the time to fill out a very personal, intimate survey. Yeah. And for some could potentially be traumatizing. Mm-hmm. And so my hope is that our society would begin to recognize and and help normalize like the role in place for birth parents in our culture. And normalize doesn't mean, you know, like simplifying or downplaying. It's there's complexity involved and I think just the empathy piece is huge. And so my hope with this study is that, you know, from the get go, we were wanting to better understand birth parents and their experiences mm-hmm. and, and, you know, their satisfaction and what factors led to that or, or led to dissatisfaction. And so that's a long winded way of me saying, I think we all do kind of benefit from hearing birth parent mm-hmm. stories, but we need to give space to allow that. And so, yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of, my closing thought. Well, Ryan, I set you up for failure because she just gave us the perfect out. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, she summed it up and put a bow on that sucker. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, Ryan. Now, you, what, anything you say is going to, you know, not be as good. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> for your listeners, we haven't covered the majority of this report. No, and we have not. We will encourage them if they're interested to go in and, and dive in and, and see what can be helpful for them. One thing we haven't talked about just because of the lack of time, we asked about post-adoption experiences. Mm -hmm. And the way we asked is we asked, you know, what did you need and what did you actually receive? And the the gap there between what was needed and what was received, it sometimes was pretty significant. Other times it was closer to what we would hope for, but often it was, you know, a, a, a big, big gap between what these birth parents said they needed and what they actually were able to get. So for all of us, it's, you know, a call for, for better post-adoption for support. For all of us, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Laura mentioned this already, that, that space for birth parents. And part of the reason for that is they talked about during the focus groups, it was part of, for them, something that could be very healing for them was to interact with other birth parents saying that mm-hmm. they, they were the only ones who could understand what they had experienced. Yeah. Even their close friends and their family wouldn't really understand what their experience was. And so they look to them. And then, you know, maybe I'll end with um, Laura and I both thanking our friends at the Opt Institute. They provided mm-hmm. a grant to make this research possible. Excellent. And it was a no strings attached. We want better information on birth parents. We support you. So we're really grateful to the Opt Institute for an ability to, to do this and to hire the researchers and to produce this uh, research report. So um, we're grateful for that. And, and then we're grateful to creating a family. Uh, you know, our pleasure. Talking about this, spread awareness. And that's part of our mission is that this information gets out and that more people understand. And then as, as Laura said, we can help normalize the role of, of birth parents. For every adoptee in our country, there are two birth parents, right? Yeah. There are millions of birth parents in our country. We often don't talk about them and include them the way we do for adoptive parents or for adopted mm-hmm. individuals. Excellent. Thank you both so much. And I'm, uh, you are correct. Research doesn't happen without somebody funding it. So I'm glad you put that out there. And it also doesn't happen without dedicated people who are willing to spend. And there was a lot of time. There was a lot of time put into this. Everyone, the link is in the show notes. Grab it and just spend some time. And, and I do mean this for adoptive parents as well. This is not just for adoption professionals. And there's good explanations to each of them. So if you hate numbers, don't worry about it. There's still <laughs> lots of information. You can just read about it. Okay. Thank you both so much, Laura and Ryan. I truly appreciate your time. Thank you, Donna. Thank you.